Okay, I see that it's uh, 8.30 Mountain Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started um, with our programming. So, uh, so first of all, I just want to say welcome to the 28th Annual Rothgerber Conference of Women's Enfranchisement Beyond the 19th Amendment. I'm Suzette Malveau. I'm director of the Byron White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law at the University of Colorado. This conference was organized by the White Center and co-sponsored by the Colorado Women's Bar Association. I wanna thank you for being here and joining us remotely. Um, I'm excited to share. We have over 500 people who are joining us, uh, either on the Zoom webinar or the YouTube live stream. So we're excited about that. Uh, thank you for supporting our programming and being a part of this important conversation. At this time, I'd like to introduce two important guests who will be making opening remarks. Then I will make some remarks of my own, and then I'll go through some housekeeping matters and logistics in terms of what you can expect for our day of programming. Uh, I'd like to start off by introducing the Dean of our law school, Jim Anaya. Dean Anaya is an internationally recognized scholar and author in the areas of international human rights and issues concerning indigenous peoples. He served as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2008 to 2014. He's the author of Indigenous Peoples in International Law and the textbook International Human Rights. He has lectured in many countries around the world. He's also taught at University of Arizona, University of Iowa. He's visited at Harvard, among other schools. So I'm happy to introduce at this time our Dean, Jim Anaya. Welcome, Dean. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I wish that I were welcoming you in person at our beautiful building here in Boulder, but uh, given the circumstances, I'm happy that we're able to have this gathering virtually. Uh, let me add my warm welcome to the 19th annual Ira C. Rothgerber Conference, organized by Colorado Law's Byron White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law. We're all experiencing isolation and the crisis that's gripping our country and the globe. Isolation from family, friends, colleagues in our communities. The opportunity to convene a group of scholars and learners to discuss matters bearing on equality and enfranchisement is especially welcome. While we're rightfully caught up in immediate concerns for the health and safety of our loved ones and ourselves, we're also continuing to engage in intellectual pursuits that bear on our long-term well-being. Thank you for joining us in this endeavor. A special thanks to the speakers and panelists at today's conference, who I'm sure will generate enriching discussions, even if remote ones. The topic of this conference is an extremely important one, and the law school is happy in this way to celebrate the centennial of the 19th Amendment and its elevation of women in the ongoing project of democracy. A word of gratitude and recognition for all those who have put in the work or who are managing the technology that allows this event to happen, including Melissa Schenter, our IT staff, John Sabre and Teresa Coberly, and of course, Professor Suzette Malvo, the director of Colorado Law's Byron White Center. Let me say a few words about the background of this conference and its namesake. Today's gathering is part of a conference series that was made possible by a generous gift from Ira C. Rothgerber, Jr. Mr. Rothgerber graduated from Colorado Law in 1935, and while at the University of Colorado, he formed a lifelong friendship with Byron White, who of course later became a Supreme Court Justice. After graduating, Mr. Rothgerber became one of Colorado's most accomplished practitioners of constitutional law, and for many years, one of this law school's most generous benefactors until his death in 1993. Mr. Rothgerber's many gifts not only initiated this conference series, but also established our White Center for the Study of American Constitutional Law in honor of his friend, Justice White. We're grateful for Mr. Rothgerber's generosity and for the opportunity today to continue the tradition that he made possible. Again, thank you all for joining us today. Enjoy the conference, and I wish you and yours 
all the best during these challenging times. Thank you. Back to you, Suzette. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, I appreciate those remarks. Um, the next person I'd like to introduce is Sarah Parity, the president of the Colorado Women's Bar Association. Um, I'm so grateful that the Colorado Women's Bar Association has agreed to partner with us this year and co-sponsor the Rothgerber Conference. So we're excited to be collaborating with this preeminent bar organization. Um, we do have with us the president of CWBA, Sarah Parity. She, it, Sarah is a partner at Lowry Parity Lebsack LLC, where she practices a plaintiff side employment and civil rights law. She is a past president of the Plaintiff Employment Lawyers Association and a former law clerk to the, to the Honorable Carlos Lucero of the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals. In 2018, she received Case of the Year awards from the Colorado Trial Lawyers Association and the Plaintiff Employment Lawyers Association. So I'm happy to welcome Sarah Parity. Sarah, will you join us? Thank you so much, Professor. Um, so when Professor Malvo invited our organization to co-sponsor this year's Roth Gerber Conference, we jumped at the opportunity because her vision was so in tune with our internal conversations about the 19th Amendment anniversary and how um, to mark that in the most fitting way. Um, Colorado has one of the largest and most active women's bar associations in the country, that's us. And our mission is to promote women within the profession and the rights of women generally, which we do in a multitude of forums, including lobbying and amicus work. We strive to be a professional home for all women attorneys in our community. And so we're constantly concerned with the need to um, attend to the variety of experiences that women with different identities have within our profession and in the larger society. And a big part of that is always re-examining the ways in which the commonly received history of women's rights and women in the legal system may gloss over all of that multifaceted experience. Um, and because we as female legal professionals have considerable access to power compared to other women, uh, we also have a lot of responsibility to remain attuned to the ways that the legal and political structures we work in every day may impact women outside those systems unjustly. And finally, as legal professionals, we're in the democracy business, and we know that bias and inequality of all kinds distort democracy. It's not just that that cuts off individual opportunity, um, but outcomes in a democratic system are also different, and I would venture to say often worse, um, when people with some experiences and identities can't participate as fully as others um, at all levels of the system. Of course, we know that when we look at voting patterns, and we know that when we look at the work of the history-making number of women in the Colorado State Legislature, a group that is increasingly diverse. So, and finally, as an organization of primarily practitioners, we're really excited to be invited into this more academic space today. And I think it's very fitting. I just learned that the conference is named after a practitioner, so that makes me happy. Um, the topics today really couldn't be more important, and I thank all of the distinguished panelists in advance for bringing us their scholarship today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate, appreciate your remarks. Um, at this time, I would uh, like to add some reflections of my own. Uh, I just want to acknowledge up front, this is an extraordinary time that we're living in and a very difficult time for so many people. Uh, I'd like to take a moment of silence to honor those who have died from the recent global pandemic, those who are sick, those who are suffering because of loneliness, economic hardship, and fear. I hope that we can collectively send strength and comfort to them at this time. Thank you. Uh, three weeks ago, we had a decision about uh, we had a decision to make about whether or not to hold this conference, and of course, that seems like a world away. But we considered a lot of variables at the time, and there were certainly pros and cons. And either do we cancel? Do we try to do this remotely? And we got a lot of input. And when I thought about the lineup of lawyers, professors, and scholars from all over the country who have worked so hard 
uh, whose message is so critical, I was reminded of why it was important to go forward. Their dogged determination to speak truth to power and to challenge us to think more deeply and broadly about the strength and struggles of women in their fight for equality remains as salient uh, today, as salient as ever. It's important to hear their voices. We need them. I'm grateful to my colleagues, Scott Skinner Thompson and Carolyn Ramsey, who pitched this topic to me for the Roth Gerber Conference over two years ago, uh, before I even unpacked my bags at the University of Colorado. And this was their brainchild. Scott and Carolyn, along with our colleague, Professor Ming Chen, have worked incredibly hard at putting together this lineup of speakers. And I'm especially grateful to our speakers today who've agreed to do this, um, all while learning overnight how to teach their classes or advising their clients remotely, uh, taking care of children at home full time, trying to stay safe and healthy in a time of social distancing and scarcity. So I appreciate your climbing this steep learning curve with me and dedicating your precious time to this project. So many of us are hungry for the knowledge, wisdom, and inspiration that you bring to the table. So today we'll be hearing about what the 19th Amendment did and did not do. The painful promises made and fissures between women surrounding the amendment's ratification. The numerous barriers to voting rights we continue to face, the desperate need to go beyond franchisement to, fill, to fulfill true equality for women, whether it's through criminal justice reform, protection of re reproductive health, employment and equal pay initiatives, or transgendered rights. The amendment's enactment reminds us of the centuries of struggle before and after the enactment for women's equality and empowerment. And although this conference is grounded in a, an historical marker, the 19th Amendment's 100th anniversary, so many of these issues are relevant today. While we've come far in the struggle, there is so much more work that needs to be done. Today, in the area of political representation, while women make up over 50% of the population, they hold only 23% of the seats in the House and 26% in the Senate. There are only nine women governors in the US states. And of course, we've never had a female president. In the area of economics, only 6.6% .6 of companies on the Fortune 500 list are headed by female CEOs. Women on average make 82 cents for every dollar a man makes. That's 70 cents for mothers, 62 cents for black women, and 54 cents for Latinas. In the area of health, one in five women have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner. And the maternal death rate for black women is 37 per 100,000 live births, more than double the rate for white women. The Supreme Court is currently wrestling with issues of employment discrimination against transgendered women, access to birth control under the Affordable Care Act, and prosecution of rape cases by the military, among others. And today, the coronavirus pandemic is highlighting the acute and gross economic and public health disparities that exist in America, which are making the poor, uninsured, and most vulnerable in our society more at risk of this disease and of death. This public health crisis disproportionately impacts women and those at the intersection and at the margins. So this is the right time to take stock. So at this time, I'd like to turn to what we can expect today from our programming and what will uh, be happening for our day. We're gonna have three panels following, by our, uh, following our keynote address. And those panels are gonna be led by our student moderators. So at this point in time, I'm gonna introduce um, those moderators. You will see them coming up later on today. Um, the moderator for panel number one is Angela Betcher. Angela is a second year student at the law school. She serves as an executive editor of the Law Review. She's interested in criminal justice reform and has worked for the Colorado State Public Defender Service and the Corey Wise Innocence Project. And she will be working for the Colorado ACLU this summer. Our second panel is gonna be moderated by Jane Waterman. Uh, Jane is also a second year student at the law school. Jane is a resource editor for the Law Review, 
and she's been involved with mock trial for over a decade. Uh, she's represented the law school at the National Trial Competition, Competition Regionals, and she's an active member of Outlaw. And then panel number three is going to be moderated by Quentin Morse. Quentin is also a second year law student. Um, he's the editor in chief of our law review. He's interned with judges on the Ninth Judicial District of Colorado, the Supreme Court, and with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And he's interested in civil litigation and hopes actually to become a judge himself one day. So our moderators are all students from the Law Review because the Law Review is going to be publishing a special symposium issue that will capture many of the articles, much of the scholarship and thoughts and comments made today in that special volume. So we're grateful to the Law Review for doing that. Now, at this time, I want to uh, mention some logistics in terms of what we can expect for our day. Uh, first of all, just a welcome <laughs> to our audience members uh, in, who are on the Zoom webinar and those of you who are watching YouTube live stream. Um, we're so glad to have you and we're so glad you're able to fit us into your day, your very busy and complicated lives. And so um, what a treasure um, and privilege to have you here. Uh, the schedule for the day is in your program, and it is available at cu.law slash Rothgerber underscore program. That is cu.law slash Rothgerber underscore program. And that link uh, will also be shown to you during the breaks. And in the program, you will see the schedule for the day. You'll see bios of all the participants. Now, what we'll be doing is we will be taking a 15 minute break uh, between panels um, so that we can dismiss our speakers and we can bring in new speakers. And at that time, you will see a placeholder on the screen. For those of you who are participating by webinar, you, we will be taking questions from the audience. Um, all you have to do is go to the uh, Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and go ahead and type in a question. Uh, your question is not visible to the audience, um, only to us panel, uh, our panelists and the moderators. And our moderator will select a few questions from that list. Um, we do apologize for those of you who are watching on the uh, YouTube live stream. You won't have the capacity to ask questions in that format. Um, there will be no need to raise hands either. We're going to go ahead and use the Q&A feature, as I've mentioned. Um, just for your information, the program is, is being recorded and is going to be posted on our website. Uh, for you lawyers out there, you'll be happy to know there are six CLE credits that are approved for this day of programming. We will email you after the conference with information uh, about the affidavit. And uh, we are also going to reach out to you later uh, to get feedback from you. We're interested, we're always interested in making our programming stronger. So um, I would appreciate if you do fill out the survey that we'll be sending. Um, of course, please bear with us if we have uh, technical difficulties. This is our first time doing this. So uh, you may see some unidentified participants on your screen. Um, if you do, those are our IT people out there to help us. Uh, they were going to stay with, they promised to stay with us for the day, so we really appreciate that. And, uh, and to, the, um, to those who are out there who are watching the webinar, um, if, you if you have technical difficulties, um, if you get booted off uh, of the webinar, please feel free to go ahead and jump on the YouTube live stream. The YouTube live stream is available to everybody at cu.law slash live. That's cu.law slash live. And uh, you can see us there, and you will still be able to get the CLE credits as well if you end up going that route. Okay, so um, at this time, um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our uh, keynote speaker. And uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, and that's okay. We might have, what it means is we might have a little, a little bit more time for Q&A than we had anticipated, and that's, that's good we'll be able to bring in some more audience participation. So, uh, so let me introduce really without further ado, uh, our keynote, Professor Riva Siegel. Uh, we are thrilled to have her in it. And again, a shout out to my colleague, Carolyn Ramsey for uh, being able to make that happen. 
Uh, Professor Reva Siegel is the Nicholas Deb Katzenbach Professor at Yale Law School. Professor Siegel's writing uses legal history to explore questions of law and inequality and to analyze how courts interact with representative government and popular movements in interpreting the Constitution. Professor Siegel is author of The 19th Amendment and the Democratization of the Family, recently published in the Yale Law Journal Forum. She's also author of She the People, The 19th Amendment, Sex, Equality, Federalism, and the Family, which is published in the Harvard Law Review. Professor Siegel is a member of the American Philosophical Society, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and an honorary fellow of the American Society for Legal History. And we are uh, thrilled to welcome Professor Siegel. Uh, Professor Siegel, it's a little early, but are you um, prepared to join us now for the keynote? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. And uh, thank you for coming in a little early to this conversation. Uh, it may buy us some more time on the back end in terms of Q&A. So uh, thank you for joining us. Okay. So shall I jump in? Please. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for that introdu introduction. It makes it sound like the 19th Amendment has been my uh, primary focus of writing when it has not been, but it is my great delight and pleasure to jump right in and I'm here to do so. So, so August 26, 2020 is going to mark the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment's ratification. And like so many things in our lives right now, this constitutional anniversary is uh, shrouded in uncertainty. Um, where are we going to be at the end of August, each of us individually, um, our families, our communities, our nation? It's, it's very hard for each of us to say, and uh, we had imagined some great celebration uh, marking the centennial in all of its complex historical dimensions, but it's a lot harder now to imagine what that centennial is going to look like, even to imagine some kind of a public gathering. And so I'm going to begin my remarks by simply sending my best wishes, wishes to each one of you listening, uh, to your families and to all of those in your circle of care and to everyone who's in need of care, as uh, Suzette did, just acknowledging that we're in this very strange time and that this is a strange moment uh, to uh, be acknowledging uh, or focusing on this issue. But also to, to note that the 19th Amendment itself, its centennial during the pandemic, has this very eerie antecedent. When I was thinking about it, I realized that the 19th Amendment's ratification was immediately preceded by the great flu pandemic of 1918. It's remarkable to think about it, but that horrible predecessor of our own historical moment just preceded the ratification of the 19th Amendment. The um, uh, combination of World War II and the de devastation of the Spanish flu together actually created imperatives for women to enter uh, the workforce, both to help care for men who had been injured in the war and who were sick, and to replace men in their various roles of life. And these critical interventions of women in both traditional care work and in unconventional roles, replacing roles that men had filled, uh, were uh, marked in public ways, helping to build momentum for the 19th Amendment's ratification as they demonstrated their centrality, their importance both in traditional and crossing over in unconventional roles. And as I thought about this chapter in the last phases of the 19th Amendment's ratification, I thought that it may well surface uh, as a more significant piece of the story of the Amendment's ratification as we move towards the August centennial. Lord knows what shape it's actually going to take. So with the pandemic rewriting our lives now and preventing public gatherings, the anniversary is bound to get overshadowed in various ways. And for this reason, I'm especially grateful uh, to the conference organizers for 
their determination to press on in this Zoom format. And I wanted to express my um, appreciation, uh, well, to the Dean, certainly Anaya, and also especially to uh, Suzette. We heard in her own statement of the conference's themes and of its significance, her own deep understanding of the contemporary public stakes of our marking the significance of this centennial and of women's citizenship, their equal citizenship in all of its complexity, both its significance in our tradition, the failures that we've had in honoring it and the important work that we have yet to do in respecting it. And I wanted to say how very much it meant to me <laughs> that the um, conference decided to proceed in its work. Uh, and it kind of roused me from my own predicaments to go forward with this um, uh, address. And I, I, I think in an important moment to try to stay on course and to sort of gather the strands of our conversation. And so I wanted to thank uh, Melissa, um, uh, the events coordinator, the IT team especially, for presenting the conference in this new format and, and teaching us all we knew to make it happen. And also the, the events, uh, oh, the, excuse me, the faculty coordinators who, who made the conference possible. So uh, with that, I'm going to try to proceed to my remarks, um, proceeding as if somehow or other we were all together in person when I know so very well that we're not. Um, and I wanted to try to set out a few fundamentals for those of us who might think about the centennial significance today or anywhere else as some building blocks that I've thought about in some of my past work, work um, that might be of interest for those of you uh, thinking about um, why centennials could or might matter. Um, the title of my talk today is Public Memory, the 19th Amendment, and the Democratization of the Family. And just to give you a bit of a roadmap, I'm going to start with a few words about um, the concept and stakes of public memory. Uh, and then in part, the second part, I'm going to turn my attention to the suffrage campaign and try to unpack my own idiosyncratic uh, perspective on how the 19th Amendment centennial concerns the democratization of the family. And then I'll go on to think briefly about how we could take this understanding of the stakes of the suffrage uh, struggle and enfold it into these recovered memories of the suffered struggle and unfold them into our law, um, both judicially enforced and legislative. And then I'll close with some thoughts about recovered memory and the models of women as constitution makers uh, that we might uh, call from it. Uh, because that's one thing for me and for others, I think, in some of our, in our history panel that might be at stake uh, in the centennial remembering that women are constitution makers too. So what's at stake in an anniversary? That's where I'm gonna start. Rather than just assuming we have one, I'm gonna ask the question, what does it mean to have them? So anniversaries are a practice of public memory uh, and public memories are a particular kind of memory. Um, well, individuals have memories about where she attended school as a child and what she ate for breakfast the day before. Public memories are a different kind of memory. So when I celebrate an anniversary like Independence Day on July 4, I'm celebrating an event in which I never actually participated as an individual. So does that mean that the event itself is a fiction? Not actually. At stake in the celebration of a public memory is something that's socially very real. When we celebrate the 4th of July, we're celebrating our birth as a nation. When we retell the stories of the colonies and the grievances and the rape from England and the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War, we may not have actually witnessed those events in our individual capacity. But when we tell these stories from generation to generation, when we teach these stories from generation to generation, we're forming ourselves as a nation. Children are taught stories of the Boston Tea Party protests and cries and the taxation without representation to explain why we value freedom and democracy. These stories are part of what it is we're talking about when we talk, when we announce the Constitution's preamble and we say, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. Collective memory is telling us who we are. And it's guiding us in our intuitions in debating with one another about what a more perfect union looks like. 
So these stories are actually mattering. They're constituting our intuitions about those very matters. Not at all a minor thing. That's what I mean by socially real. So for public memory then, we've got narratives that are constituting us as a community, that are creating our identity and our sense of justice, our sense of values as a people. This kind of public memory is actually open and contestable. It's a field of meaning in which we're negotiating who we are and what we're going to do together. So when women suffragists wanted to demonstrate the injustice of their disfranchisement, they appealed to the memory of the American Revolution. If all Americans recalled and celebrated the Boston Tea Party and anchored through their stories the principle of no taxation without representation, the suffragists would appeal to those memories in making their case for the vote. They invoke the memory of the revolution and ask how a nation founded on the principle of no taxation without representation, founded on the principle of democratic self-government, could deny women the vote. They mobilize collective memory to contest their own disfranchisement. Today, as we approach the centennial, the very memory of the woman suffrage movement is itself contested. So we can think about the dominant themes of the centennial, and we can see that the centennial is surrounded with efforts to wedge open the story of suffrage struggle so that it comprehends the experience of many more women, especially including women of color whose claims to vote were denied and deferred and devalued by a white-led movement for so many years. So you can see this is again, the contestation of public memory. I'm gonna give you another example. This January, on the anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision in Roe versus Wade, the annual March for Life claimed uh, that the 100th anniversary of the, they claimed the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment for the pro-life cause. They argued that the women's suffrage movement was an anti-abortion movement, a claim I've countered at some length. See the Washington Post in January. Spoiler alert, suffragists lived at a time of open patriarchy. And they knew that women's decisions about childbearing were shaped by the laws that governed the conditions under which women conceived and raised children. So without ever supporting abortion, they understood that decisions about abortion were governed by many, many laws and not the law of abortion alone. But it was never a single issue question. See Washington Post in January. I'm going to let that question go. What's the point of looking at these interventions? They point to us to the fact that the memory, the public memory of an event is a powerful, powerful unit of meaning around which we shape our collective identity and our senses of what's right and wrong. So, I could easily take either one of the two examples I've just given you as a locus for this lecture. And believe me, I considered quite long and hard the prospect of going in either of works down this road. But I decided I wanted to go in a third direction. And I'll tell you how and why. So each one of those examples focuses on the collective memory of the woman's suffrage movement. And the direction in which I would like to take this lecture focuses not on the collective memory of the movement, but rather on the collective memory of the nation itself, in particular on the Constitution itself. When you put the question of the anniversary in those terms, you can confront a striking fact. When you when we, rather, recount the making of our fundamental law, whether the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, we recount it as the making and the work of men. There are no women on the scene. No women on the scene. Well, we do have Betsy Ross flowing, sewing the flag. 
or Abigail Adams reminding her husband, John, to remember the ladies. But basically, we tell the story of the Constitution's founding, the country's making, without reference to women. How many of us were taught that Abigail Adams' letter admonishing John Adams to remember the ladies continues on darkly to warn him, do not put, su put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. Imagine if con law proceeded. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebe rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Imagine if that were the text for our original meaning. Imagine if that were the basis for studying the Constitution. But no, it is not. <clears throat> Highbrow constitutional law differs little from public school education. It's not only the stories of the founding that feature an all-male cast of characters, the cases of the constitutional canon barely and rarely feature women. Erasure is nearly perfect. Just as women are absent from the stories we tell about the making of our constitution and our constitutional law, so too is the 19th Amendment itself. The constitutional text and history of the 19th Amendment explicitly concerns women and models women as constitutional makers, and yet the 19th Amendment plays no role in constitutional interpretation, even in the law of sex discrimination itself. Think about that erasure. It is in impressive. Impressive. As evidence of women's near perfect erasure as makers of law. It's important just to take that in. What follows in the remainder of my lecture is one brief account of arguments about women voting followed by a discussion of the ways that public memory of women's arguments for voting could be mobilized in constitutional law and politics. And in fashioning this account, I'm drawing on the essays mentioned at the beginning of my lecture, the 19th Amendment of the Democratization of the Family, um, this January in Yale Law Journal Forum, and my paper sheet with people in the Harvard Law Review. I'm really only taking some strands from each of them but they're modeling something and I intend them to be illustrative and not exhaustive of the ways in which public memory claims might be enfolded into our constitutional law. So I begin my account with a core claim of my work on the 19th Amendment for the last several decades that women's quest to vote is a quest to democratize the family. Of course, the word family nowhere appears in the text of the, the amendment's rights or powers bearing provisions. Section one of the 19th Amendment provides the right of citizens of the United States to vote or shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state account on, on account of sex. Section two provides Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. On the face of it, the amendment certainly seems to concern voting and not families. But then what was the problem for which this amendment was a remedy? Today, we think of the United States as a constitutional democracy in which the principle one person, one, one vote governs. Whatever can be said about the one person, one vote principle as a description of current practice, and we could say a lot about it, <clears throat> that principle has no bearing on our democracy at the founding. At the founding, the United States was a constitutional democracy in which only a minority of citizens voted. The distribution of the vote at the founding was not a matter of accident or even of prejudice, but of institutional design, designed to give some members of the polity power and authority over other members. It was a structure. Unequal distribution of the vote at the founding was a structure of governance, a feature of the state. So how exactly did our constitutional forebears justify giving the vote to men, but not to women? Here is exactly where the family enters the story. Very, the very same colonists who fiercely protested Britain's claims that the colonies were virtually represented in the British Parliament viewed women as virtually represented in the state by their fathers and husbands, who were said to vote in their wives' and daughters' interests. Today, we think of the family as a private sphere having little to do with politics or the market. But at the founding, the reverse was the case. The household was a core locus of government and of commerce. Our constitutional republic was institutionally embedded in the household. 
Think of how Blackstone, or the common law of con contracts or torts, models the household. The founding generation understood the domestic relations of the household, husband, wife, parent, child, master, servant, slave, as relations of governance. As head of household, a male property holder, holder who voted was thought to represent the, the relations of all who depended on him, not only sons and daughters, but also wife, servant, slave. Over time, members of the household were given direct representation in the state, but resistance to enfranchising women persists well into the 20th century. These household relations were at the core of the debate about women voting. The woman question, um, as, it was, as the vote debate was called on both sides of the Atlantic, was a debate about the family. This is not some coy characterization. It was the heart of the matter. The family was the locus of the suffrage debate for several reasons. The first we've seen is that men claimed women were already represented through the husbands and fathers who were supposed to vote in their wives' and daughters' interests. The second reason followed directly from the first. Women argued they needed to vote precisely because men, in fact, failed to vote in their wives' and daughters' interests. Suffragists argued that women needed to vote because virtual representation was no representation. What caused the law entrenched male interests and perspectives that injured women. This is not some presentist observation that I'm making. To the contrary, in the years before the Civil War, abolitionist women suffragists argued the point in exactly these terms. In an 1852 Women's Rights Convention held at Syracuse, Antoinette Brown, who would later marry Henry Blackwell, so she goes by the name Blackwell, argued that the law is wholly masculine. The framers of all legal compacts are restricted to the masculine standpoint of observation, to the thoughts, feelings, and biases of men. The law then could give us no representation as women, and therefore no impartial justice, even if the present lawmakers were honestly intent upon this, for we can be represented only by our peers. At the famous 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, abolitionists attacked the idea of virtual representation by, represent, by presenting a declaration of sentiments which they modeled on the Declaration of Independence. They presented the law of the family as prime illustration of the law's bias in favor of men. Echoing the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of Sentiments announced that history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of men toward woman having indirect ob object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. Just echoing the Declaration of Independence. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world, having deprived her of this right of first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he's oppressed her on all sides. The Declaration then immediately appointed, appointed to the common law of marital status, to family law as the exemplar, the exemplar of law's uh, male bias. He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. He has taken from her all right and property, even to the wages she earns. Showing that the law of the family did not represent women's interests punctured the core claim of virtual representation, that men took their wives' and daughters' needs into account in crafting the law, at the same time showing that the law of the family did not represent women's interests, demonstrated to women why they needed to up and mobilize for the vote. And as we sample women's account of why they needed the vote, not simply their abstract claims about democracy and the principle of self-representation, but their concrete claims about the injuries law inflicted upon them as women, their need for political representation as women, we uncover a record of constitutional consequence, a vernacular account of liberty and equality spoken by women of different social classes over the decades. Here's an argument for the right to vote expressed as a protest about the way the law structures property and sex in marriage. I'm going to read to you now uh, a passage that, from a letter that appears in the Women's Journal, um, a newspaper of the American Women's Suffrage Association that was published by Lucy Stone that I've much loved, um, but it seemed to capture the voice of the voiceless. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I've, uh, uh, I've preserved it, and I've, I, I, I want to share it with you. 
Um, Stone published it, I think, because it represented for her voices of many she had heard. As a mother, a woman goes, this is from 1875, as a mother, a woman goes through the tragedy of giving birth to her son, watches over and cares for his helpless infancy, brings him through all the diseases incident to childhood, is his nurse, physician, seamstress, washerwoman, teacher, friend, and guide, spending the cream of her days to bring him up to be a voter with no provision in law for her own support in the meantime, with not so much as, as an I thank you. Then he leaves home and marries a wife whom it took some other mother 21 years to raise, educate, teach, to cook his meals, to make and wash his clothes, to furnish him with a bed, and to fill a home with comforts of which he has the larger share at her own expense. And all this done for him up to this period of his life without any cost to himself. And then he votes to help make the law to disfranchise his wife and these two mothers who have unitedly spent 42 days of the 42 years, excuse me, of the prime of their days for his benefit without any compensation. And then he makes another law to compel his wife to do the same kind of drudgery which his mother had done with the addition of giving birth to as many children in his good pleasure he sees fit to force upon her. And all the earnings and the fruit of her labor are his, his wife being the third woman who spends her life to support him. It takes three and sometimes four women to get a man from the cradle to the grave in a pretty good busy time they have of it too. It's time we stated facts and called things by their right names and handled the subject without kid, with kid gloves. So in objecting to the way that the law of marriage enabled a husband to expropriate the value of his wife's household labor, to force her to bear children, the letter writer is seeking power to change the law. Just simply pointing to the way law structures marriage and saying, this is law that I have no power to change. This is law I would change had I the vote. The letter writer is talking about the vote as that which would enable her to change fundamental entitlements, structure, and the institution of marriage. These are claims for economic and sexual em emancipation of women. Women in the suffrage movement regularly called for joint property rights in marriage. They would have used the vote to abolish a husband's property rights in his wife's services and to recognize joint property rights in marital assets that would have the effect of remunerating a wife for her contribution to the household economy. Women regularly asserted claims for voluntary motherhood. They would have used the vote to abolish a husband's right to his, wife, his wife's sexual services and recognize the wife's right to say no to sex with her husband, having the effect of giving her control over the timing of motherhood. Lucy Stone described in this in the antebellum period, described this right as a right of self-ownership. Quote, it's very little to me to have the right to vote, to own property, if I may not keep my body and its uses in my absolute right. Not one wife in a thousand can do that now, and so long as she suffers this bondage, all other rights will not help her to, to her true position, close quote. In supporting voluntary motherhood, movement leaders claim for women the right, quote, to decide when she shall become a mother and how often under what circumstances, close quote and attack the law of marriage, quote, which makes obligatory the rendering of marital rights and compulsory maternity, close quote. Many other women, perhaps reticent to employ the individualist language of women's rights, turned the care ethic of domesticity to suffrage ends. A broad-based temperance movement advocated for what they called a home protection ballot. In mobilizing against drinking, women raised issues of domestic violence, sexual abuse, and women's need for empowerment in the household and in the public sphere. Frances Watkins Harper employed the language of Christian motherhood in her temperance work to cultivate intraracial and interracial alliances. And her project of home protection included campaigning for federal protection against lynching. Over time, the suffrage movement began to reimagine the possibilities of the public sphere itself. Suffragists arguing as mothers asserted they needed the vote to do care work that necessarily reached into the public sphere what they began to refer to as social housekeeping. They talked about the need for the vote to address regulation of municipal services and the industrial conditions in which they and their children worked. And they began to imagine a vote that could enable them to do care work on a new scale, a new form through the state in the form of controlling public health. So women's reasons for demanding the vote offer a vernacular account of the stakes of self-government and the meaning of freedom and equality for those denied political voice in the early years of the Constitutional Republic. We can describe this recovered record in classically gendered terms. 
Simply put, we can see that women demanded the vote to secure their economic and sexual freedom from men. We can describe the changes women sought in more institutional terms. Women sought the vote to democratize the family. They sought to change family law, to redistribute political voice, legal authority, economic opportunity, <clears throat> and resources in the household so that its adult members would be equally empowered and recognized. And we can describe the changes women sought in brute political terms. They sought political power and a reorganization of the public sector to help protect the most vulnerable families in the community. Women sought these changes on the understanding that the work of social reproduction was essential for democratic life, that full and equal integration of those who perform the work of social reproduction is a necessary condition of their equal citizenship in a constitutional democracy. Centuries before Susan Oaken um, ever wrote, women seeking the vote understood that the household was a critical institution of a constitutional democracy, no less than the legislature or a school or the press. They understood certain minima of physical integrity, whether freedom from domestic violence <clears throat> or freedom from lynching was an integral element of home protection that women needed the vote to secure. A vote means little without the freedom from intimidation to exercise it. In their stories for why women needed the vote, we have the vernacular account of liberty the Constitution um, protects that is race and gender, protecting against lynching and sexual assault and forced motherhood in ways one does not encounter in the United States reports. It turns out there's a long running conversation about women's needs for the vote, much of it circling around the family, understood from different community and generational perspectives that we could draw on in understanding our constitutional tradition. This long running conversation begins in the abolitionist movement, extends through the Civil War as abolitionists seek universalist for a, a universalist 14th Amendment that would enfranchise women and the freed slaves and then founders on the drafting of the 15th Amendment as the movement divides over whether it can support an amendment that would enfranchise freed slave men only, and then continues on to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. My democratization essay samples that conversation for 100 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, as women argue that the 19th Amendment is not sufficient to ensure equal citizenship, reasoning about many of the themes on which I've touched in increasingly modern terms, yet through figures, through constitutional architects, whose names have now been completely lost to public memory. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to think some about how we could integrate <clears throat> public memory into our law. <clears throat> <clears throat> so arguments of the kind we've been examining are for the better part lost to public memory. Who knew the vote was about family? Assuming that these or other such arguments about why women needed the vote could be recovered, in what sense do they have any claim or prospect to be integrated into our law? <clears throat> On one account, this material is constitutionally immaterial. <clears throat> At a time when there was an all-male electorate, women simply failed to move the Republican Party to draft the 14th Amendment to recognize universal suffrage, nor did they move the Republican Party to draft the 15th Amendment to recognize women's rights to vote. Nor was women's popular constitutionalism, <clears throat> their spontaneous voting under the 14th Amendment, the new departure, it was called, enough to move the Supreme Court to recognize women's rights to vote under the Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause in Minor versus Happersack. Does this mean that their arguments have no constitutional meaning for us today? I think not. We should no more dismiss women's arguments for the vote than we would dismiss challenges to slavery before the Civil War or challenges to Jim Crow before Brown. We can recognize that women lost these political and legal battles in their own day, that their arguments did not prevail in a classic lawmaking model and still deem them of great significance to us today. So I wanna talk a bit about how we could incorporate the public memory of suffrage argument in our own constitutional law 
and then close by talking about the stakes, about why we might care to do so. Women's quest for the vote spans at least a century and several constitutional amendments. The claims begin in the anti-slavery movement in the 1840s, become part of arguments for the 14th and then the 15th Amendment. <clears throat> and when the demand for suffrage, women's suffrage is shut out of Reconstruction, spends several decades more in the wilderness of state constitutionalism before resuming life in the quest for the 19th Amendment. And even after the 19th Amendment's ratification, women of color are still seeking the right to vote all the way until at least the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. If we don't want to say they're still seeking it today. So those seeking women's right to vote under the 14th Amendment may have been shut out from Reconstruction, but it was only because they were ahead of their time. In fact, we could also look at them as pioneers of our modern constitutional order. Crucial. They were out of sync with their own constitutional day, but they were pioneers of the present. They combined the individualism of the revolutionary constitutional tradition with the radical egalitarianism of the anti-slavery constitutional order to propose a 14th Amendment recognizing universal suffrage, a new understanding of the Republic in which all adult members of the household would be equally and directly represented in the state. This understanding that the 14th Amendment would have enfranchised all adult members of the polity was repudiated at the time, but supported by uh, the leadership of the abolitionist movement. I'm going to give you now uh, Ellen, Francis Ellen Larkins Harper at the 11th National Women's Rights Convention in 1866 and listen to how modern her voice sounds. She's speaking at the early drafting of the 14th Amendment, quote, we're all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving a curse on its own soul. She spoke of the wrong she suffered as a colored woman through marriage law and segregation law and envisioned the logic of the American Revolution culminating in a colorblind nation that would, quote, have no privileged class trampling upon and outraging the unprivileged classes, but will be one great privileged nation. That's her language. So this universalist vision of the 14th Amendment wasn't embraced until the era of Brown and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. If we wanted to incorporate the debate over when voting and our understanding of the Constitution today, and we wanted to incorporate a greater range of constitutional speakers, how can we do that? The simplest answer I can give is that we would um, not approach the 19th Amendment as a freestanding piece of constitutional text. Rather, this decision to include women as a member of the constitutional community affected all aspects of the constitutional order and it needs the 19th amendment needs to be incorporated synthetically at the very least with the reconstruction amendments together but really synthetically with all the preceding elements of the constitution i'm going to just not as a freestanding piece of constitutional text so just to give concretely the case for synthetic interpretation i want to talk about that just very briefly um, and I'll just limit my case to talking about the reasons why we would want to read the 19th Amendment together with the 14th and 15th Amendments. The first is historical. The quest for suffrage begins in the 1840s and extends all the way either we want to count it till 1920 or 1965, depending on how we're going to date it, or we could treat it as still ongoing. So, if we're going to consider it as arcing through the life of several constitutional amendments, um, we need to uh, interpret the amendments together or we're going to artificially divide the history into disjunct pieces that will fail to capture the interactive parts of women's long quest to vote. Two, synthetic interpretation is necessary to capture that campaign in its intersectional racial complexity. If in fact, we divide it, it will subdivide the experience of uh, women as they seek recognition in different constitutional uh, amendments. Um, and uh, it will subdivide the experience of people of color. Third, synthetic interpretation is necessary 
to integrate stories from the history of women's mobilization into the large body of existing sex discrimination law under the 14th Amendment and into the large body of race discrimination law under the 14th Amendment. And it would avoid frustrating debates about whether the 19th Amendment is best read as a non-discrimination rule concerning voting only or more expansively as a constitutional mandate for equal citizenship, a conversation I have addressed but I'm not going to go into now. Fourth, I know that there are almost an infinite number of possibilities for incorporating the uh, range of uh, public memory of su suffered su struggle into our constitutional law. But I'm going to start at a very high level of abstraction and point to your attention the fact that the history that I'm speaking of has life both as negative and positive precedent. What do I mean by that? It is both a history of wrongdoing. We acknowledge that the exclusion of so many members of the American constitutional order from political voice is now what we consider a great constitutional wrong, which needs repair. Um, and also, it is a great source of positive precedent. It is a story of people struggling to democratize the American constitutional order. It is the story of people asserting principles of repair and principles that show us a path to the modernization and uh, in increasing uh, opening of the American constitutional order um, and their heroism, their constitutional heroism, provides models that we can look to, to emulate and to lead us forward in time and to diversify our models of constitutional leadership in time, okay? And so I want to just, at the gateway, when we think about the importance of public memory in this way, point us to the fact that every story of past wrongdoing has both this kind of two-dimensionality to it and to see that already in the story that I've told you thus far, we can see it in both of these aspects. As I said to you that what I'm doing here, I understand as a piece of a story, but a piece of a story that models possibilities for other stories that could um, develop in its wake. All right, so um, with the opening that I've suggested, I point to you the fact that United States against Virginia, the equal protection sex discrimination precedent, speaks dramatically about the fact of women's disfranchisement continuing into the 20th century and creates something of a constitutional portal, an opening uh, for including um, into our story the um, uh, uh, history of the suffrage struggle. Uh, Ginsburg speaks about that story and it provides an opportunity to include the history of or the public memory of women's disfranchisement uh, into our constitutional law. More particularly, Virginia gives concrete direction uh, of the following kind. It directs sex classifications may not be used as they once were to create or perpetuate the legal, social, and economic inferiority of women. That direction um, nearly invites synthetic interpretation. It expressly directs judges to consider the 19th Amendment's belated enfranchisement of women as judges enforce the Equal Protection Clause. Since the 1970s, the courts prohibited sex stereotyping under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause and asserted that no longer is the female de destined solely for the home and the rearing of the family, and only the male for, male for the marketplace in the world of ideas. We can read the 14th and 19th Amendments together, and they would give specific constitutional grounding to the disestablishment of traditional sex roles in the family, amplifying the constitutional authority of the sex discrimination case law in ways that those concerned with original understanding can respect. It's not only that, as Steve Calabresi has suggested, judges concerned with original meaning can find additional authority in a synthetic reading of the two amendments, for enforcing sex discrimination law. More to the point, more to the point, the history of women's subordination, the history of past wrongs can guide judges in enforcing equal protection so they understand how to comply with the court's instructions in Virginia. Sex classifications may not be used as they once were to create or perpetuate the legal, social, and economic inferiority of women. 
combining the equal citizenship guarantees of the two amendments and the histories informing them may guide judges in identifying the distinctive threats to inclusion in the constitutional polity that women face. In my essays, I give several examples of how this could be affected. I point to one now involving pregnancy and another involving sexual violence. I'm gonna speak about them very briefly. Um, one, uh, I note that um, in the case of pregnancy, equal protection case law has um, focused almost completely on the body. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time to unpack this example, but I have a paper that's coming out in Georgetown in the ABA Symposium on the 19th Amendment, and it simply invites you to think about the puzzle in terms of social roles. The entire history of women's regulation under the suffrage story is as a dependent citizen member of the family. And when you put up the pregnancy discrimination cases against that case law, you understand almost immediately that body is only the tiniest piece of the story. And you can understand cases like Godolding against this longer history and we're almost faced directly with a story about um, enforcing gender roles, sex roles that becomes legible and connected back to the sex stereotyping that the, is at the core principle of the court sex discrimination cases. Another example that I play out in both of the essays um, goes not from the rights clauses under Virginia, but the power clauses. The 19th Amendment has an enforcement clause, actually, which Leah Littman and Rick Hazen write about in that same Georgetown Symposium. Um, but I also write about it in my several essays. One can look at 19.2 and 14.5 and, uh, together as a source of power to enforce equal, um, uh, 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 equal protection and equal citizenship under both equality granting clauses. And here, take a look at the history of our federalism. In United States against Morrison, the court acted as if it was not possible to find a law that could redress sexual violence against women. That's the case involving the um, uh, gender motivated violence under the civil rights remedy, which the court refused to enforce uh, in that case, um, acting as if the history of families and federalism had never been altered since the founding. If you follow my story, that's a misrepresentation of our constitutional history. The history of the suffrage is a long intervention in the regulation of the family. Um, in fact, a regulation, an intervention in the regulation of the family on behalf of women's equal citizenship that wholly supports regulation of the kind at issue in Morrison. Given the intervening 20, 30, 20 years since Morrison, close to 20 years since Morrison, and in particular, the intervention of uh, Me Too, it is time for us on the suffrage centennial to revisit Morrison, no matter where the federal courts, and to revisit the case for federal regulation, if necessary, of assault and any form of sexual violence in the family. There are resources um, in 19.2, and in 14.5 with this history to make the case. I wanna close now by pointing us in my final moments uh, to the last feature of this um, material, which I think is a really uh, compelling and an important one. And that really concerns um, the, what I'm calling positive precedent in this story, um, not just the history of wrongs to be righted, but the history of uh, women struggling to right those wrongs. And here I want to really think about the stories of constitutional makers to be recovered here. So the long quest for suffrage features audacious dreamers who dared claim new, more egalitarian forms of citizenship and the family of constitutional community that we're still realize, really trying to realize today. And whether these architects of our present could vote in their day, we can recognize and honor them in our own. And here my point is that it's time to break the vestiges of virtual representation in the ways that we interpret the Constitution. 
where we still talk about the founding and the framing and many other questions as if only men made the Constitution. Only those who had the prerogative to vote were the ones who actually made the Constitution. The Constitution was made in waves and waves. It was made by those who lacked the vote. It was made by those who resisted even when they could not vote. And it was made well after the formal acts of constitutional framing ended. When Justice Thomas quotes Frederick Douglass in a debate over affirmative action, he does not pause to establish whether Douglass could vote. Despite Justice Thomas's claimed fidelity to originalist methods. Think about that. Douglas is exerting a different form of authority for Justice Thomas and for American audiences today. The same form of authority that Francis Harper might, or Mary Church Terrell, or Ida Wells Barnett, if enough judges recounted their claims on liberty and equality, or if enough constitutional claims makers might begin to teach the judges to appeal to them. We have to treat them as authors and architects of our constitutional present. And as we do, they will come to make meaning for us today. So in the democratization of the family, the essay from which I'm speaking, I trace women making claims for voice, recognition, and inclusion, requiring not only a vote, but also a fundamental transformation in the ways we understand the family as an institution of our constitutional democracy. Beginning in the 1840s, these contemporaries of Douglas express understandings of foundational freedom, such as Stone's claim, it's very little to me to have the right to vote to own property if I may not keep my body and its uses in my absolute right. She was not seeking abortion rights, but she was seeking autonomy, physical security, and respect. Changes in the law that would allow women control over sex and motherhood. It's time we threw off the final vestiges of virtual representation in our own thinking and recovered the voices of these constitution makers whose only fault was to be visionaries, so far ahead of their own times that their peers were not yet ready to listen to them but we can listen to them. We can begin to recover the generations and generations of Americans who were not given a vote or authority to craft law in their own day, but who had views about what a constitutionalist democracy needs to be. What we will discover is that we can yet learn from them and be led by them. As the wife's protest letter that Stone published shows us, these suffragists saw the household as a critical site of democratic citizenship for those who perform care work and those who receive it. They located the voluntary motherhood and the value of care work at the core, not the periphery of our constitutional order. A message all the more central at this time of profound insecurity, when the economy is at a standstill and the line between paid and unpaid labor is up for grabs and the work of social reproduction and its centrality to our survival is now visible for all to see. If we recovered these generations of constitutional making women, and we and the men who supported them, and we would have a radically different understanding of our constitutional tradition. Its complexion would be fundamentally different, as would its concerns. We differently understand the wrongs that are at the root of our constitutional order, that would guide an intersectional understanding of equal citizenship law, and we would differently understand who might inspire our law. So as the 19th Amendment enters its second century and we continue to argue over the meaning of our constitution in courts and in politics, it's time to appeal to a wider cross-section of esteemed Americans, embracing the disenfranchised as well as the enfranchised and the concerns they brought to the democratic reconstruction of America. Imagine how we might understand our constitution in another generation if we did. Suzette, it's yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Siegel. That was, uh, that was very powerful. I really appreciate uh, your perspective. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, we're going to start with two of our historians who uh, will be um, we'll be presenting later on panel number one, but I would like to bring them into this conversation. Uh, professors Carolyn Ramsey and Julie Sook. Uh, professor Ramsey is a law professor at the University of Colorado, one of my colleagues, and uh, Professor 
Sook is a professor at CUNY uh, Graduate Center. So I'd like at this time um, to welcome them to the program so that they can pose um, a couple of questions. And then after that, I'd like to open that up to the, um, to the audience um, for, for questions. So at this point, may I have um, uh, Professor Ramsey join us? Yes, good morning. Thank you so much, Riva, for joining us this morning and Suzette for organizing this wonderful webinar. And I'm so glad that we were able to do it as a webinar despite our difficulties. Riva, I have so much respect for your project, both for its use of history and its modern political and legal relevance. And I love the idea that people, audacious dreamers, can be founders before they're enfranchised. So I apologize for asking a rather pessimistic two-part question. The first wave of uh, the women's movement fractured after suffrage. Alice Paul favored an equal rights amendment. Crystal Eastman and others objected to the racial exclusivity of the National Women's Party platform. Still others were content to work for opportunities for women without fundamentally challenging their role as mothers and homemakers. So first, could you briefly describe how this division fits into your story and second, given the recent failure of a diverse field of Democratic presidential candidates to yield a nominee who is either female or a person of color, how can we overcome class and racial divides among women to achieve the democratic reconstruction of the family? And I raise the second question because the unlikelihood that the Roberts Court will adopt a synthetic approach to the 14th and 19th Amendments makes voter unity and legislative change vital, I believe, in our current political moment. So, um, I, it's, it's, it's strange. I thought whether to omit any reference to juridical or court-centered, um, incorporation of this law in favor of a just straight political uh, framing of the material, which is totally legitimate and credible. I don't, you know, much of my work uh, focuses on what I would call legislative constitutionalism, the constitution outside the court. And I understand that as having equal, if not greater dignity to judicially enforced constitutionalism and certainly understand it in present circumstances as of the moment. But it is generally my sense that in our court-centered constitutionalism, law is not law until it's also constitutional law in a court-centered way. And my sense is that if one can't articulate how this is court-focused constitutional law, it won't be read as constitutional law. And so, my sense is that um, it needs to be expressed both ways to have traction in our legal culture as law, even though I'm not holding my breath for Chief Justice Roberts to invoke it in that way. One. Two, um, I wrote She the People, um, it published in 2002 and got almost no take up virtually no take up, save by Steve Calabresi. Um, uh, and that really points to the doctrinal categories in which people reason about problems that are deeper than I think people's political biases are. And really is not a, a problem that can be parsed by, uh, you know, politics of appointing party or anything of that sort it really have to do with the ways that we understand um, the, the sources of our law. And I think that the centennial has provided the closest shot to a chance for all of us to think about the ways we make claims on or understand the sources of our equality law that any opportunity that's passed and so if people want to talk about this, I'll talk about it and find out if it makes any difference. I mean, probably the supervening um, pandemic has 
foreclose that possibility again, but nonetheless, um, try it one more time and see if it makes a difference. There's been some really interesting historical work and legal work done in the past year, so maybe there will be more traction. Um, but I, I think that work matters first, more than people's, um, I don't know, normative positions matter. Sort of where do we even think or look when we imagine sources of, of law, okay? Um, and then the last thing I'll say very briefly is, well, tell me your last, oh, people's divisions, right? Um, I don't think it's a natural state of affairs for there to be cross-class coalition amongst women. I think it's a, a episodic uh, uh, event for there to be a mobilization that uh, really, I mean, women are members of multiple social groups. And only episodically do they actually act as women. And often they act as members of other political identities first, or they're acting concurrently as members of multiple political identities, and only sometimes do they rise up with their identity as women first. And it's just not clear to me um, at what junctures and in respect of what questions they're going to act around um, these issues, you know? The question as to how despairing to be, I think our landscape right now is so about to be up, reorganized in so fundamental a set of ways. Um, I think we haven't even got a clue as to how profoundly it's about to get reorganized, no matter who asserts control in the immediate short term that almost every institution of social life um, is going to be fundamentally shaped and reshaped by this. And while many groups will bid, make bids to take control of them, the what of what they're going to take control over itself is going to be evolving. I want to let other people in, so. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, Professor Sook, did you have a question for us? Yes, thank you so much, Riva, for your uh, powerful as usual talk. Uh, I just wanted to raise a question about the meaning of dem democratizing the family, because I think there were two ideas about democratizing the family that came up and surely we'll discuss uh, throughout today's webinar. Uh, one is that there's a separate spheres tradition in which women are primarily responsible for childbearing and child rearing, which justifies their exclusion from political rights like voting. Uh, and the movement for suffrage uh, is an attempt to reorder the family, democratize the family in the sense of redistributing responsibilities within the private sphere so that they're more egalitarian. Uh, but there's another discourse of democracy that becomes very powerful around the time that suffrage succeeds. And that's one that envisions people who are participants or primarily participants in social reproduction within the home as moving out into the political sphere to make democracy different, to make to re restructure the public sphere as well, uh, and so I and I wondered also if there was a tension between those two ideas, uh, because uh, certainly one explanation as to why it's difficult for women to participate in the public sphere um, is that we haven't succeeded enough. Uh, at making the family egalitarian. And even when we do succeed in small measure, um, there are cultural barriers uh, to the combination of uh, egalitarian public sphere relations and egalitarian family life relations. So I wondered um, if we could uh, discuss that and open that up a little more, those two ideas of democratizing the family and democratizing or making the family uh, an important part of what happens in the public sphere. Um, thank you. Um, these are wonderful questions. I should say I'm just mindful of time or I could be going on for a really long time with each of them. So, um, so for those of you who have a chance to read my democratization essay, um, it uh, takes root actually in my reading a woman named Crystal Eastman um, which, who writes a wonderful and in fact widely known speech on Now We Shall Begin which is um, basically uh, a response to uh, getting the vote, treating the vote not as an end to the whole endeavor, but as only the beginning. Now we have the means, just as so many of these speakers are saying, 
Now we have the means, the political voice to act on our predicament. Now we can exercise it. And what she does is try to express um, her now 1920 understanding of what is required to translate so many of the themes of the 19th century women into a new form, into a new, what, this new term that exists in the, the 20s, feminism is a new term. The women's rights movement is now, which is a new cultural understanding of what's involved. And indeed, they are trying to imagine reconceiving to bend gender is starting to come into public view. And um, she's imagining work inside the home and outside the home. And um, she's also a socialist. So she's worked with, um, she's created uh, the accident, a workers comp for in New York State. So she's uh, in touch with women across classes. And she is now advocating for contraception. So she's imagining the idea of voluntary motherhood, including sex for pleasure and not merely saying no to sex. And she's also trying to imagine the idea of um, sort of being a, a mother's pension being supported by the state rather than a husband. Uh, and that is to say, care work being supported as a public matter and not just as a private matter. Um, and so there's the beginnings of a transformation in this time period of the materialist feminist understanding that's in this earlier work in a way that's moving outside of the family. This is also the period, the first big legislation that's passed with the vote is the Shepherd Counter Act, which is the first public health bill. It is the first time the federal government passes a law providing for maternal infant mortality interventions, and it is then defeated by the AMA by 1928. So there is the beginnings of a new imagining of the public sphere and the public sector that is growing out of the various interventions in the family in this movement. And there is the boundary, new, new imaginings of what's public and what's private that's growing in this movement in ways that are very exciting. And there is a new, bound, new ways of imagining gender that's growing in this movement. All kinds of things are alive in this movement. And you can see it evolving from generation to generation. Thank you. I, I want to turn to, uh, we, have, we have questions from the audience. And I apologize. Uh, we are not going to be able to get to, um, the to many of them. Um, we have hundreds of you in the audience at this point. So, Bear with me. I'm going to pose two questions at the same time, Professor Siegel, so maybe you can take a crack quickly at, um, at both of them. Um, first, we have a question here. Um, this is, uh, the, this is uh, question is, Chile's, citi Chile's citizens will be voting next October in a plebiscite to approve the process of a new constitution drafting. If approved, the new constitution will be drafted under gender parity. The process will be the first in history with women participating in the constitutional design in equal number as men. In terms of substance, however, gender parity does not guarantee a quote, feminist constitution, unquote. What are, in your opinion, what uh, the main elements of a feminist constitution? That's the first question. My second question that I've, that I've received um, that I'd like to pose for you is, was the suffrage movement primarily developed for the rights of all women or just rights of white women? So if you can, we have about two can minutes left. Because I say the second question again? Second one, was the suffrage movement primarily developed for the rights of all women or just rights of white women? Um, we have just, just two minutes. <laughs> but if you could take a crack at um, just giving us some thoughts related to those two questions. Um, it's pretty wild to answer either of those questions in two <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Sorry. So, like, I, almost <laughs> impossible. Um, so I will say that um, if I followed my Crystal Eastman reference, which I would encourage people to take a look at, one um, feature of this conversation that I've traced through the, the debate over women voting is that it focuses constitutionalism 
on family and not just outside of the family as an important feature of constitutionalism without my saying in some trans substantive sort of way that I have the key to what a feminist constitution focused on the family would or wouldn't incorporate or do, but rather only that um, the structure of social reproduction, of care work, um, matters constitutively. Uh, those who perform it um, are essential in their work in the uh, constitutional order, and they're both mattering and their dignity and their worth matters and their voice matters. And that is a key piece of the story that's emerging from this um, account. On the question of the suffrage that you, um, suffrage movement that you just raised is the second question. I will point out that the movement whose life I just uh, described for you um, was rooted in the anti-slavery movement in the United States, that it began uh, as an effort to end slavery, that it began um, in an effort to combat the central injustice of American life in the um, early 19th century, and that much of its reasoning about both the marriage relationship and of women's disfranchisement grew out of those struggles over the institution of slavery, that many of its leaders um, cut their teeth in that struggle, um, including even those who do get reviled in the struggle over the 15th Amendment, Stanton and Anthony, who led the petition drive for the 13th Amendment. So there's a long, it's not a one minute or a two minute history. There's a very long, complicated history to be unpacked here that is full of both um, important moments of convergent commitment to justice, the story of the 14th Amendment that I told you at which Harper spoke was one in which the movement sought universal suffrage for both the emancipated slaves, men and women, poor women, as one constitutional, great constitutional reform that was repudiated. And I think it's an important root understanding of the source of the women's suffrage movement. And even when the movement failed and divided over the 15th Amendment, there were plenty of white suffragists who backed the freedom fight of slave, of African-American slave men, including Lucy Stone, whose voice appears in this lecture today, or for that matter, when um, the 19th Amendment was ratified and African-American women failed to have their vo voices and their votes um, respected, women like Crystal Eastman who stood up and fought for them. So while it's important to recognize the failings of the suffrage movement and the failings of white women, it would be wrong to celebrate this anniversary by only, or only telling the history here as one of interracial failure. There are moments of commonality and, and making of common cause that are important also to celebrate and respect because uh, we need to learn from our errors and to find grounds of commonality in which to move forward. Thank you, Professor Siegel. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. We could continue to, we'd, I'd love to take more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time at this point. Um, this does conclude the question and answer period of the keynote address. Professor Siegel, we are so honored that you have um, shared, your, um, shared your scholarship and um, your brilliance, and so we very much appreciate that. Um, we're now gonna take a 15 minute break. Um, we will be resuming our programming at 1015 Mountain Time um, with panel number one. So I'm gonna ask the audience just to sort of stay tuned. And at this time, we're going to bring up the panelists um, for panel number one. If you would please um, join us. And we are going to um, have to say goodbye to Professor Siegel. So thank you again for your contribution. Uh, we so appreciate it. And um, uh, we're going to uh, proceed with our programming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you also for uh, Carolyn and uh, to Julie and especially to you, Suzette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Riva.